And now what I want to do is the last section. I'm going to summarize two other issues of macro theory connected to organizational issues. Eco-Marxism is one, and there's the global versions of this. One of them is called dependency theory. Anybody heard of dependency theory? No? Dependency theory means that there are core areas of a world system and they dominate other areas and they steal their materials. So one group develops and one group underdevelops. They, the one person, one group that develops robs the development from another country. This was developed to understand the history of Latin America. Latin Americans invented these ideas. It was taking Marxism which was very much a nationalist, uh, originally a nationalist analysis, into a global analysis. So, you know, all the materials in Latin America, they never made Latin America rich. They get shipped outside, and the manufacturing, and the value is created elsewhere, and all the wealth is taken out. And they argue it goes from city to city. There's a core area, and uh, within the extraction countries, there's other peripheries. There's a city that's based on extraction, where the elites are not connected to the local state in Latin America or anywhere, but the elites really are there only because another empire put them there. And they are there to make sure the raw materials are stolen out of the country. That's basically what they're for. That's a very critical theory about raw materials in the world system. And it has two themes. One, core areas, two extraction areas, really three. This is a state-dominated world economy. States do this, not the system itself. However, a different theory built upon this in the 1970s by Emanuel Wallerstein. Anyone heard of Wallerstein? Okay. Wallerstein came to an idea that there's a world system and states participate in it, but nobody's in control. It's very unstable. So, this is dominated by a state. It's a clear political control. This is an uneven economic control, where capitalists, if they want, they abandon their home country. If the capitalists don't like this country anymore, they leave it. And this core state collapses. So, capitalists don't belong anywhere. They are constantly moving for good investments around the world. And this brings some states up and pushes some states down at the same time. He says, you have to analyze commodity chains. This is what the dependency theory said. You analyze the commodity chains of materials around the world, but it's without a singular state-dominated world economy. And he has three different positions. He still accepts the core. There's still a core area just like the dependency theory. This means an area of industrial manufacturing. This means an area where labor has a high pay rate. You know, lots of skilled labor, well-organized labor, maybe democratic politics, um, a lot of value-added products, high electronics, Korean electronics. But go to, hmm, where would you go? Go to India, you're exporting tea or you're exporting rice, there's not much value added. It's very, that's a periphery. You're an exporter of materials. You have very low rates of labor pay. You have very precarious, uh, unstable economic conditions. What is this? This is his addition. The semi-periphery means sometimes if the world system changes, capitalists leave one area and they go to another area and they may turn a periphery into a semi-periphery. The United States, it wasn't the United States, it was the British colonies. And the British colonies were periphery. They were raw material exporters to England. So the United States was once in this position. But over time, it gained its own position. More finance capital, more value-added products, more money into industrialism. And it pushed other countries into peripheral status. So a semi-periphery is Wallerstein's uh, 
idea. This can go up or down. Some people argue, Wallerstein, that the United States from the 1970s is losing its core position in the unstable world system. It may be militarily strong, but economically, the world is losing its core Americanism. It's rapidly decentralizing. This is the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, India, China. And uh, maybe fall into semi periphery states. Still very economically kind of powerful. It also helps explain how places like Korea, which exported rice and tea during the Japanese occupation, now export cell phones to, to Japan. Um, so you can understand the movement of capital and materials around the world. Um, this could be what lecture by itself. The main point is remember these three words. And think about it is without a singular state domination. That's his theoretical idea. Wallerstein feels that if you want to understand a country's history, don't read the country's history. You need to understand the international trade relationships because those have created the states of the modern world. It is not a state by itself that has created the modern world. Korea was not built exclusively by Koreans. You need to think about the sponsorship, the international movement of capital, the changed relationships of trade after the cheap forms of transportation in the 1960s. All these things from the outside created Korea into what it is today. In addition, obviously, to a lot of hard work, but it's people seizing the chance. That's Wallerstein's phrase. People seize the chance when the system is unstable. And Korea did well in seizing the chance and has moved up into the OECD status. These unstable shifting state statuses can have mobility up or down, as I said, in the wider hierarchy of domination and control of either material extraction, or you know, industrial power, financial investment. There's um, somewhat an update to this. This is still based on countries, right? It's still a country view. There's just no country involved. 30 years later, I would argue Sasky Assassin provides us with an update to this world system. She says now, states are not the unit to analyze. They're cities. Certain cities have gotten to be core. And their own country is periphery. A lot of people in Korea, they use the phrase Republic of Seoul. They don't say Republic of South Korea, they think Republic of Korea. They consider Seoul as having all the power. And Seoul has all the international businesses, mostly here. It has uh, the major national banks, finance, insurance, legal firms. Um, they all have branches here. So Seoul is not Korean, she's arguing. And other places like Tokyo, Osaka, Berlin, New York City, Chicago. These are no longer country-based cities. That all of these cities have a similar international quality. And this similar international quality means they are the ruling elite. The cities rule. And they rule over their own country. And they rule together over the world system. So she sees a centralized flow of foreign direct investment um, where world cities manage the flow of investment around the world. Um, it's centered on select cities in the world and a consolidated domination over decentralized production. Computerization is very important. Computerization allowed the centralization of finance and allowed the decentralization of production. For example, cars. When Korea was rising economically, cars were all built in the same country. Now they're not. So it's very hard to build a car and raise a country. Now if you build a car, one part comes from Mexico, one part comes from Brazil, the other part may come from China. And then it's assembled somewhere, and then it's shipped to a market. The only people in control are the people in the banks directing the movement of capital and the organization 
She says the world's cities have begun to be powerful because to control a decentralized world, you need a very centralized financial service. And she says a lot of people 30 years ago said, wow, the world will develop, everything will be less hierarchical. She documents in her book that the world is more financially centralized now than it's ever been. But it's decentralized in material production. And I think that's an important contribution, which is very different than 30 years ago, talking about that. Um, just to mention this quickly, there's a national version of eco Marxism. This was, you know, the global versions. And the national political version is known by the name Schneeberg. And Schneeberg's book from 1980 described a treadmill of production. And Schneeberg's treadmill looks like this. Um, he did not draw this graph. This is my graph. Schneeberg says there are states, you know, there's monopoly capital. And then there's laborers, workers, citizens, consumers. And he says, an eco-Marxist view is these groups cooperate. These groups cooperate with each other. And they conflict with each other. They expand the scale of their production. In a Marxist view, it's different. Marx would say, monopoly capital, labor, you know, they fight. They don't have anything in common. Marx would say monopoly capitalists dominate the state. Steinberg says historically these groups come to an agreement. In real life, they tend to cooperate because monopoly capital convinces the state, convinces labor, that economic growth is beneficial for everybody. And this has environmental issues. So he says, it's good for a while, but eventually, you know, the environment is negative. And environmental movements may change the attitude of the state. It may change the attitude of laborers to stop supporting the monopoly capital. But right now, he says, as long as people accept the ideology, and he calls it ideology, as long as people accept the ideology of economic expansion, you cannot change the treadmill. He calls this accelerating. Basically, accelerating, getting faster. But he says the solution to environmental problems is decelerating to make it small again. The state could change its policies to encourage smaller production. The state could stop supporting monopoly capital and support small-scale capital. These are decisions. So he sees cooperation and conflict between three areas, whereas a Marxist view only sees two areas. And Schneeberg says the environment comes into this because with more materials into this cycle, there's going to be, he says, more environmental problems by definition. That's a Marxist view, that economic development is against environmental improvement.